Uh, let's bring on our first panel. All right, good. So um, once again, on behalf of the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center and the National Resource Defense Council, who is our partner for this particular panel and for this event, let me welcome you to our first panel. Um, this panel is on global energy and climate security. What could be a better topic to kick off this event with? Um, and we're also going to consider the impact, of course, on national security. So it's that nexus of all three. And not only apropos in terms of today and what we're seeing around the world and here domestically, per Congressman Raj's discussion, but this is our mission here at the Ver Veterans Advanced Energy Project. As Dan Mish talked about earlier, our mission is to empower veterans and military spouses to continue to serve in the advanced energy industry, to give them a venue to continue to serve. And it makes sense to them intuitively because these are veterans and military spouses who for the past three decades have experienced firsthand what it is to be energy dependent, too energy dependent upon other sources around the world. And we've been fighting great patriotic wars all around the globe in response in one way or another. They, they get that. They also get the national security implications of climate risk because here again, they have responded to humanitarian assistance disaster relief operations and those like them, security operations, around the globe as a, res as, as, as a result of climate change and the exacerbation of regional instability due to climate change. And it ha it's not only overseas in terms of our ability to respond and set the conditions for the kind of lifestyle, the American life that we want, but it's here domestically as well. We're gonna talk about our military installations, which are currently under threat. And not just the, you know, the ubiquitous threat of uh, hurricanes ramping up the East Coast and, and the flooding, you know, sunny day flooding in places like Norfolk. In fact, Bob, I think you, you talk about that in your book. That's right, yeah. But, uh, but on the West Coast, right, with a wildfire threat. Camp Pendleton's just about burned down a couple times. You know, the heat out in Yuma, you know, across the Midwest, the, the drought, is making it very difficult to train. Very, very, very difficult to train. And these are the bases that we deploy, we project power around the world from. So if we can't train, we can't project power, we got a national security problem, folks. So climate change, once again, is a, is, is a national security, uh, uh, creates national security instability. So, so with that, um, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to do some introductions here. And then I'm gonna ask a few questions, but be thinking about the questions you wanna ask our panel because we have a very esteemed panel, uh, very lucky to have them, public, private, nonprofit, across the spectrum. These are experts in their trade. Uh, Zara Summers is Vice President of Science at Lanza Tech right here in Chicago. And her portfolio is the kind of portfolio you would dream about, uh, particularly this day and time. Pretty good place right now with the Inflation Reduction Act passing at uh, Lanza Tech sustainability, corporate research and development, and strategy development. What's more, we have big energy here on the panel, right, with, uh, with Zara. Zara, prior to joining Lanza Tech, Zara was head of bioscience at ExxonMobil. She created the first ever bioscience department pioneering biologically based solutions for fuels and products to reduce carbon intensity and environmental impacts. So, Zara, welcome. Thank you. Gosh, I was like managing director, Deloitte Consulting, Government and Public Service, where he leads sustainability and climate adaptation support to clients across the firm. Josh is an internationally recognized expert on climate and disaster resilience and has had a long and distinguished career to include a number of senior administration positions, such as Associate Director for Climate Preparedness and Resilience at the White House Council for Environmental Quality and Senior Advisor to Secretary for Infrastructure Resilience at U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Please wel wel welcome Josh to our panel. <laughs> Bob Keefe is the author among the group, Executive Director, Environmental Entrepreneurs, and a longtime friend of the Veterans, Veterans Advanced Energy Project. Bob has recently written 
Climatonomics, I got it right. Nice. Practice <laughs> that. Washington, Wall Street, an economic battle to save our planet. Once again, what, 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 what couldn't be more appropriate for our discussion today? Notably, blurb by far-fetched people such as Arnold Schwarzenegger and our own advisory board member, John Powers. Previously, Bob was National Resource Defense Council, and before that, a journalist with the Atlantic Journal Contributor, Cox Newspapers, and the Austin American Statesman. Welcome, Bob. <laughs> Drew Warren is Senior Advisor, Veteran Affairs and Public Policy at Dominion Energy. Drew has 25 plus years of global experience, national security operations, government policy implement implementation oversight, development of strategic partnerships, and advising senior leaders across the military, government, and business sectors. Drew is a former Marine Corps Infantry Officer, U.S. House of Representatives Armed Service uh, Professional Staffer, Senior Special Assistant for Legislative Affairs within the Office of Secretary of Defense. In other words, a distinguished career of public service. Please welcome Drew Warren. <laughs> Robert Rudish is Department of Energy's Office Director and Energy Attaché at U.S. Embassy Warsaw Poland. Previously, Robert was a U.S. Army and National Guard officer and worked in the Office of Radiological Security at the National Nuclear Security Administration. It's particularly interested to see Robert's uh, LinkedIn posts in Polish talking about energy security in Europe. And his priorities in his current roles are to reach net zero while ensuring energy security in the region and across the Atlantic. Welcome, Robert. Okay, so distinguished panel, lots of opportunities, lots of ground to cover, let's get to it. Um, Zara, I understand that uh, Lanza Tech recently developed an important new technology that converts carbon emissions from steel mills or gasified waste biomass directly into monoethylene glycol, MEG. That's right. How I'm does this promote U.S. climate and energy security? Well, I think a way to look at it is it's not just MEG, it's ethanol, it's isopropyl alcohol, it's acetone, it's a suite of other chemicals we have in our pipeline that's coming online as, you know, as we speak, my folks are in the lab making it happen. And when you think about what we're doing, it's, it's we're creating a list of products we can make from emissions, emissions from steel mills, from refineries, from gasified biomass, um, even landfill gas. And why, why is that important? It's, it's taking things that we have in our communities, things we have distributed throughout the country and making them the feedstock to make these products. And so that ethanol can go to polyethylene. That ethanol can, we have a process through Lanzagut to make sustainable aviation fuel. So MEG, all these other, other products are things that we currently would rely on other sources or potentially fossil sources. And I know oil and gas is here. I was oil and gas for <laughs> 10 years. But I think it's an all hands moment and, and bringing, bringing it home and making any community resilient enough to, to use what, what is within their reach to make these important products. I think that's, I mean, that's how we are self-sustaining. Right. So how does that compare to time at ExxonMobil? Um, I learned a lot at ExxonMobil, um, but right now, when I think about the speed at which we take something from the lab and put it in a commercial plant, it's really hard to do that in some organizations that are in risk management, you know, and every, every new technology, switching technologies to bio is a risk. And we were joking about, at, at the table I was sitting at, they're you know, a fast second, maybe fast third. And so when I left ExxonMobil, it was really to see things happen quickly and see technology developed in a way that we weren't reliant on everybody getting on board with a new technology. It was really technology focused, getting, getting things deployed rapidly because the climate is warming. The climate is changing. It's not gonna wait around for us to, to really do everything to get everybody on board. It's 
some pioneers need to get out there and show that it's possible to, to drag everybody else along, kicking and screaming, or you know, following gladly, sure. depending on the industry. <laughs> but I, I think it's agility, it's flexibility, and it's speed, which is the biggest difference I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hey, Josh, uh, so the proposed Inflation Reduction Act <clears throat> is going to require strategy, policy, implementation to meet targets. How can Deloitte Federal help the federal government meet these targets? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, let me take a sponsor's privilege here for one second Please. and um, say welcome to Deloitte Chicago. Uh, we're glad to have you all here and a special uh, thank you for your service to our veterans and our military families who are joining us today and online. Um, you know, we, we heard the Congressman talk about the speed at which we kind of got to a decision once we got to a decision, and we've been talking about this for two years now. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the important part of this is about the investment and the assurity investment. And this is a conversation I have with government all the time um, and with folks who want to know, you know, how do, in government, how do we make the private sector, how do we bring the private sector to the table in something? Mm -hmm. I said, you know, the private sector doesn't mind risk. It, they make risk decisions all the time. Mm -hmm. But they have to understand the risk. And they have to understand that this is not something that's going to change tomorrow. That they have a long-term um, guideway to actually do this work. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what gives us mm -hmm. the ability to get folks to make that investment. Mm -hmm. um, there is so much patient capital out there looking for these types of investment. Mm -hmm. Trillions and trillions of dollars. I mean, the money that Congress has put into this is great. But the money that we need to access is mm -hmm. private sector investment. Mm -hmm. And private sector investment wants to be here because institutional investors mm -hmm. want to be in this space. OK, so how does Deloitte help? Mm -hmm. um, you know. Deloitte has been, we've been in business for 178 years. Um, and I recently joined the firm, so I've learned all this really cool stuff. And, and we're the largest. you large have to vest over all that? Yeah, yeah, it's 178 years. Yeah, you, you, it's, a, it's, it's a great deal if you can stick it out. Um, we, have, we have a really good health program to help with that. But um, what, what is fascinating about the firm is, you know, the two things that the government needs in this space, um, two, two things the government doesn't need in this space are policy help. Very clearly, the White House and Congress have, have made it very clear what the climate policy of this country mm. is, okay? Mm -hmm. The other one they don't need help with is science, because quite honestly, they have some of the best climate scientists in the world, NOAA, NASA, the other science agencies. Mm -hmm. What they do need help with is program implementation and measurement. Mm -hmm. How do you measure success? Mm -hmm. How do you implement these programs? Mm -hmm. How do you measure success? Mm -hmm. Well. We've been doing program implementation pretty much as long as the firm's been around. Mm -hmm. um, and we have certainly been doing measurement for 178 years. Mm -hmm. About every quarter. Yeah, uh, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and so what we help clients do is figure out what the outcome looks like. Where do you want to be when you're done? What does success look like? What does success look like and how do you measure it? Mm -hmm. What's keeping you from getting there? Mm -hmm. And design programs, tools, and processes to help you get there. Okay. Um, our goal is to help clients be successful. Okay. And that's what we're doing with the federal government. You got the contract. Thank you. <laughs> so, my, so, my work here is done. So, so let me follow up. What, what does this mean to our audience? A lot of our audience uh, are either transitioning service members, military spouses, or they're, they're in the industry. They want to transition in the industry. What does this, this Inflation Reduction Act mean in terms of jobs to our audience? Well, I'll, I'll Quote President Biden, when I hear climate, I hear jobs. Okay. And there are a lot of jobs. This creates a lot of jobs. And these are good, high paying jobs. These are jobs that people know how to do. This is not, you know, um, Dr. Southern, excuse me, this is not working in her lab, right? It could be. It could be. <laughs> and and there are and there are a number of our veterans who are well qualified to do that. But there are also a number of our veterans who are well qualified to do the work that we are talking about doing. Some of that is engineering, some of that is installation, some of that is manufacturing, um, some of that is um, getting out into the community and talking to people about what, what we have on offer. 
Yeah. And those are jobs that will exist, and they will exist all over the country. Mm -hmm. These are not just technology jobs that are going to be in San Francisco and you know New York um, or Austin. They are going to be all over the country. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and, and just as a reminder, we're going to have employers strewn about those tables, as Dan Mish talked about, as some of these breaks, you have an opportunity to talk to them. Um, Bob, let me, let me turn to you. Thank you for that. That was, that was great, Josh. Um, Bob, let me turn to you and, and ask you, I know that you, you talk a lot in your book about uh, DOD installations yeah. and, and the climate peril to DOD installations and what it means from a national security perspective. Can you talk a little bit more, what is that peril, how serious is it, and how is DOD doing at getting at that Absolutely. risk? Yeah, thank you, Greg. I, I must say, though, when, when I know your background as a base commander and I saw that clipboard, I thought we were going to have <laughs> push-ups or something up here. So I'm glad. Old school, glad, man. Yeah, that's right. There you yeah. go. Well, look, I want to talk about what happened three years and 11 months ago uh, uh, in my home state of North Carolina. It, in September of 2018, Hurricane Florence washed ashore on the coast of North Carolina. Had Camp Lejeune straight in. Hit, hit it dead center, pretty much. 6,000 housing units there, 70% of them were flooded. Out of the non-housing uh, non units there, almost 90% uh, were flooded. Caused something like uh, $7.5 billion worth of damage. They're still cleaning it up today. One month later, uh, Hurricane Michael slammed into Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida's Panhandle, home of the 325th fighter wing, mm -hmm. most expensive planes on the planet. Tindal Air Force Base. That's right. Right, F-22s. So that's right. Uh, yep, that's yep. right. Uh, uh, almost 100% of buildings there were damaged by flooding. Still cleaning that up, something like $5 billion damage. Five months later, middle of the country, not too far from here, off at Air Force Base, uh, home of the doomsday planes, the, fl the flying white houses when we're at war. Uh, uh, nuclear war or otherwise, got hit by the worst thunderstorm event in the history of our country, a derecho. Uh, flooded the runway so much that it's unclear whether those planes could have even gotten off of the mm. ground. Another three, four billion dollars. That one, that one six, eight month period alone, we had more than ten billion dollars worth of damage mm -hmm. to our military bases. Guess mm -hmm. who pays for that, guys? Mm -hmm. Me, you, everyone in this audience, and everybody that uh, pays taxes in this country. Mm -hmm. So climate change is, has become, yes, we know it is a national security issue. It's been a security, national security issue even before Chuck Hagel said in 2014 that it's a threat multiplier. But it's also an economic issue now. It's a huge economic issue. Across the country, climate-related disasters cost our country about $150 billion last year alone. That's just indirect damage, and a lot of that, as mentioned, there's nothing that, uh, uh, that is different about a military base or uh, housing uh, development in the middle of the country or on the coast. They're going to get hit. So this is a huge issue. The military, fortunately, has started to figure this out, but I think, Greg, you and I agree that they're not going fast enough. Yeah. Uh, and climate change comes in many forms. Uh, yes, it's those storms that we've been talking about, but... Greg, I know this is important to you, uh, heat, uh, and heat in places like whether it's um, uh, Fort Hood in Texas or Paris Island where you were, it's hard to train when uh, it's too hot for humans to be out there for a, a long amount of time. Yeah. So it is a huge issue, and it's something yeah. we've got to address. So, you know, J Josh talked about establishing standards that help the government get to where they want to go. Yeah. So how's DOD doing in, in, in determining or defining what success looks like for its installations? What, what is a resilient installation by you know, DOD terms? Well, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I know that some other people on this panel probably have a better idea, but I think it's really a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and uh, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. uh, for businesses, for business people, for the people that work at those businesses to make those bases harder. Well, yep. good news well, is you got, you got the guy who actually knows the answer to that yeah. question coming on the screen, I right. think, after us. And the work that, that Richard Kidd and the team um, right. at OSD is right. doing mm -hmm. around climate adaptation is amazing because good. they are tying it back to the mission. Good. 
And that is what what you need to do in DOD is sure. you need to tie it back to the mission. Right. It supports the warfighter. Yeah. Okay. Directly. And and is money flowing in support of mission readiness and, and making these installations more resilient? Well, money is always flowing in support of the warfighter and making things ready for the mission, right? Yeah. So yeah. when it when you tie it back to the mission, yeah. there are always resources yeah. for it. And yeah. you know, and the secretary made it very clear in his the first thing he put out, mm. um, you know, around uh, COVID and climate change, mm -hmm. and that is very, very important. Um, mm -hmm. If you read the the letter, the uh, uh, intro to the DoD climate plan, mm -hmm. um, yep, this is part of the mission. Okay, good. Um, well, thank you, thank you, uh, Bob. Hey, Drew, let, let, let's pull Dominion Energy into this. Uh, obviously, you know, nationwide energy company. Uh, for those who don't know, Dominion is putting together one of the largest offshore wind systems in the world. No easy thing. Um, fundamentally changing the equation, the energy equation, at least up and down the East Coast and maybe beyond. What does the Inflation Reduction Act mean to Dominion Energy in terms of the way you're going to do business now? And, 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 you know, how you maintain that baseline power and, you know, the whole, right, you know, formula of, of old energy, new energy, and so forth. Yeah. Well, let me just start by thanking the Atlantic Council and, and Greg for the opportunity for Dominion to partner and, and be a sponsor of, of this event. And I say that because um, this is really important to our company, our culture. This is part of uh, who Dominion Energy is, is to be uh, with groups such as this and um, to talk about these issues and then be in the conversation of change and leading that as we go forward. So uh, again, on behalf of our leadership team and uh, our customers across 16 states, um, we welcome you and, and again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, so. I will answer that question by kind of going back to a previous topic, which was jobs. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think Josh talked about that. And what I will say is that for veterans and for military spouses and for the demographic that um, I hope, uh, you know, is listening today, much of what, because I went through this through my transition, much of what you desire is to find not just a job, but you look to find um, that purpose. And uh, one of my, um, you know, Dominion senior executives uh, has been quoted as saying that we are in a time now transitioning to clean energy, which will be the most important and positive economic transformation since the internet. Now, whether you believe that or not, um, I would say that uh, there's certainly a lot of evidence in that. And if you don't think that's a significant, um, you know, time in our history and, and purpose and calling, um, you know, again, I think history will be the judge. But what we offer, not just at our company, but across this industry, is the ability to, that's right, change the way we work, live, and um, our behavior and how we act, which will eventually lead to um, you know, helping save some of um, our, our planet for future generations. But we're in a time of significant innovation. Um, the president of the Virginia portion of our business has been with our company for 28 years, uh, Mr. Ed Bain, and he said, you know, in the first 22 years, um, the amount of innovation and change and technological advancement that occurred uh, was equal to what he's seen in the last six years. Mm. So, you know, mm. in, in his time across, um, you know, the industry of producing energy from gas, um, oil, coal, all of that, to now uh, solar, wind, uh, and how we balance the portfolio, which mm -hmm. I think is, you know, the question, mm -hmm. how do we do that responsibly uh, and certainly wind will be a part of that, but from a responsible uh, perspective that our company looks to do for our customers, 
we believe that reliability is our first and foremost job. Um, and for those of you who have served in uniform, it is mission first. You know, people always, you hear that a lot. If you don't accomplish the mission, and for us, that's providing reliable energy to our customers. Mm -hmm. At a affordable uh, means, and doing it in a safe way mm -hmm. for both our customers and our employees. Mm -hmm. Those are what drives us every day. <coughs> and so this offshore wind project is uh, you know, the largest investment that we have ever made, um, $9.6 billion, uh, a project that you know, would, at completion of 2026, would be able to power about 660,000 homes. Mm. Um, so it is significant, uh, but that doesn't mean we're not going co to continue to do uh, energy production in other ways as well, because we recognize that we can't control the weather. And um, we will have uh, good days and bad days um, that will land upon our 176 turbines uh, when it's in full operational capability. But until we get to that point, um, you know, we have to maintain to keep the lights on. And that's our, that's our pledge to, to our customers. So it's a balance of, uh, you know, what the Inflation Reduction Act, it, you know, certainly provides a lot of opportunity and jobs, a lot of innovation opportunity for our company. Mm -hmm. And I think probably lastly, it provides uh, a way for us to serve our nation and our community through, um, through security. So let, let, let me pause on that, that last point about security. Do you see, from Dominion Energy's perspective, public-private opportunities in order to harden our DOD installations and improve resiliency? Absolutely, and going into kind of one of my previous roles when I worked on the House Armed Services Committee, mm -hmm. um, I had the readiness portfolio, and right there we saw that energy resiliency is mission readiness. and. Um, Unfortunately, you know, and I can kind of speak about, um, you know, th this is probably negative, but I understand why this is the case. Um, you know, operation and maintenance, for those of you who understand budgeting and O&M funds and uh, FSRM, the facility uh, rest restoration and maintenance funding, is often the bill payer for transformative capabilities we need to fight and, and win in the future, right? And so O&M is where we don't uh, fund to where we should. And that's where uh, upgrading and maintaining our, our grids and um, our infrastructure of on-base facilities um, takes probably a back seat. Dominion has uh, got numerous projects both completed and underway where we are partnering to uh, help upgrade, uh, make more resilient, make more secure uh, through our feder federal energy solutions program. And again, if you're someone who's looking to transition into a role, this is a way to still maintain some of that, um, you know, con connectivity with, you know, the milit uh, military and federal um, bases and, and facilities, mm -hmm. because. We know now that uh, to attack and to uh, disrupt doesn't mean coming through the front gate. It often means finding a way into the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, if you can't take off and recover aircraft, and if you can't maintain your communication suite, which requires um, electricity and power, then you won't be able to accomplish your mm -hmm. mission. So mm -hmm. uh, we take extreme uh, pride and are humbled by the fact that we're able to not only be the energy provider uh, for the Pentagon um, and for many of the other uh, significant national security agencies within the Northern Virginia area, mm -hmm. but we look for ways to partner with these groups mm -hmm. to upgrade their structure and uh, maintain their, uh, their security. Thank you for that. Do you see opportunities for our audience and those that are listening in in this, uh, this fundamental transition to cleaner energy, more secure energy? 
Absolutely, and as I mentioned, I think that you know there are a lot of new technologies, uh, battery storage, um, solar, wind. Those are all things, but we have to still maintain our core capabilities. And we have line workers uh, that are the, I mean, the backbone and bedrock of our company that are out there every day um, ensuring that power is being delivered to, to our customers. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, you know, kind of watching COCs, if you will, that um, make sure that the load is distributed equally. The number of kind of uh, similarities between, you know, things that you would find in military day-to-day uh, -day operations and how we run our company, mm -hmm. uh, very similar, and uh, we welcome uh, in every aspect of our company. We would love to bring in our veterans, military spouses, as they seek transition. Opportunity to continue to serve. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. thank you. I hope we're gonna come back to that too, by the way. Jobs. Go ahead. No, no, I don't wanna jump in. Okay, we'll come back to that. Remind me. Hey, Robert, let, let's, let's turn to a completely different perspective here, right? You know, from, from your perch over in Europe, uh, how is Russia weaponizing energy? And what are the second, third order effects that you're seeing from Poland? It's a great question. Um, you know, first, I, I do want to thank you for having me here today. Uh, we get tremendous support from, from the Atlantic Council, uh, both the Department of Energy, uh, the Global Energy Center has been a great supporter of our PTEC initiative, Partnership for Transatlantic Energy and Climate Cooperation, which ties right into this. Um, okay. And we have a brand shiny new Atlantic Council office in uh, Warsaw, Poland that we're wow. really excited about. Unpaid political advertisement <laughs> for Atlantic Council, <laughs> nicely done. Um, so, so I'm really glad I could Your be here. Your fees are waived. Because <laughs> this is a really important nexus. Yeah. Um, you know, energy security is national security. Um, it, it is it is such a key piece of what we do. I mean, we, we assume that if we just flip a switch, the lights will come on. If we dial the thermostat, we'll have the temperature we want. When we need gas, we go to the pump. Um, and what we're seeing in Europe is people questioning that, um, questioning that, that assurance. Um, so a, as you mentioned, uh, you know, Russia, Russia is absolutely launching uh, an energy war against Europe. Uh, the conflict in Ukraine um, extends far beyond Ukraine's borders. Uh, we're a couple hours drive in Warsaw, but we can see across the continent, um, people are getting worried about their supply of energy. Uh, there is, there's more than enough gas uh, if Russia would choose to export it. Uh, and by slowly constraining the supply of energy uh, and slowly eliminating Europe's gas supply, what they're hoping to do is to cause that very instability um, for people to, to question their, their government's ability to provide. Um, and for governments, for our allies and, and partners um, to, to start to wrangle amongst each other, to create division as they fight for limited mm -hmm. resources. Um, so we do have the Partnership for Transatlantic Atlantic Energy and Climate Cooperation uh, mm -hmm. through the Department of Energy, mm -hmm. along with a, a, a number of initiatives through the Department of State and Defense and other entities mm -hmm. to help our European allies um, mm -hmm. and, and to, to help make sure that, that, they, that they can cooperate and coordinate and that we can get them the resources they need to preserve the stability they need um, and, and to keep their economies going. Um, so, you know, short term, that means bringing in energy resources from around the world, including from the United States, uh, to, to help them help them replace some of those volumes that Russia is withholding. Mm -hmm. um, it also means coordinating, coordinating not only to 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 share the resources they have, uh, but to use them a as efficiently as possible to apply some of these things uh, that we 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 talked about a little bit in in the uh, Inflation Act and in the BUILD Act, um, apply these technologies and techniques to make sure we're, we're really keeping all the energy we have and using it as efficiently as possible. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we also have to look longer term, um, you know, to look at ways to kind of permanently remove this leverage that Russia has, uh, to make sure that Russia isn't in a per position to perpetually be uh, agitating in Europe and compromising security in Europe by eliminating the dependency on, on Russian hydrocarbons, on Russian energy mm -hmm. in general, 
uh, both for the stability uh, of our allies and also a, as an opportunity to bring in new technologies, to bring in these clean energy technologies uh, that in a lot of cases can, can replace Russian hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, another European member, European Union member, Germany, arguably the most powerful country in the European Union, has gone to war footing with regard to energy. And a lot of people are questioning whether Angela Merkel made a wise decision in divesting Germany of its nuclear power, you know, back, I think, around 2000, what, 10, 11, 12. And now there's a sense that perhaps Germany is a little bit overly compliant with regard to the Russian invasion. What's your sense from Poland of all that? You know, I mean, the, the view from Poland, uh, the view of the Polish government ha has long been that, that Germany has an over-reliance on Russian gas. Uh, and the Polish government has raised this issue on a, on a number of occasions. Uh, certainly, the, the German economy benefits from a low cost of gas. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, you know, when she was in leadership, Angela Merkel, Angela Merkel made the decision to, to shut down um, the country's nuclear fleet after Fukushima. Uh, you know, we certainly took a different decision here in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, here in the United States, we've kept our fleet running and we're growing our fleet. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, there's a, a lot of great, a lot of great resources in the Build Act and the, in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act to help keep our nuclear fleet up and running, so that we do have that that domestic supply of energy. Uh, you know, one of the great things about nuclear energy is not only is it clean, but it's very easy to keep multiple years of, of fuel on hand. Mm -hmm. so that you don't have to worry about, you know, what today's flow is or, mm -hmm. or ne next week's flow. You can have years. Um, Baseline power. Yeah. And, and Germany has, has, has gone to a lot of renewables as well. Uh, renewables are great for energy security. You know, nobody takes your sun and wind away. Mm -hmm. um, but, but not having nuclear energy puts them in a much more challenging position than they would otherwise be in. Mm. Craig, one note, there, there's also money in the IAJA on small modular reactor research. Um, okay. And that's, you know, I think instead of just saying we're going to keep what we have, we're actually going to figure out what works mm -hmm. going forward. And advanced nuclear is clearly part of that investment that Congress has funded. Yeah. And we're going to start, for, you know, for the first time in, in a generation, really, we're going to start new, new, new nuclear reactors in the United States this year. And for the first time ever, we're going to start advanced nuclear reactors this year. Uh, we're going to start two in Georgia. And then, as you said, we're going to bring a whole host of SMR technologies online. Uh, Department of Energy is funding a tremendous amount of work there. And I can't tell you how much appetite there is in Europe for this. Uh, I, I don't think a hmm. day goes by where I don't hear from a new contact about wanting to bring a new uh, advanced nuclear technology into Europe or from a European counterpart asking how they can deploy nuclear technology on the continent. Uh, the Navy guys out there know we've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, they've been <laughs> floating them around the world, right, Dan? So, hey, uh, let me ask the panel writ large, uh, just to follow up on the, what do we think of small nuclear reactors, modular nuclear reactors, from a national security application perspective? In other words, there's talk about using them to power a thought, the Ford operating base. Uh, are we comfortable with that? Is this, is this something that, no kidding, we can do securely? And uh, in the near term, anyway, any any thoughts on that one? I, I think we don't know the answer to that right now, okay. which is why we need to do the research okay. and we need to look at this. Safety and security have to be key to that, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. There are some inherent things from a um, kind of engineering standpoint around these uh, uh, small modular reactors yeah. that allow them to be. Um, less likely to get into a situation like uh, Fukushima or okay. um, Chernobyl or any of the, I mean, you can literally drop them in a swimming pool. So okay. um, there, there are some inherent things in it and why that technology really needs to be advanced. Okay. Um, but we shouldn't be making decisions about what we're going to do without actually putting the work in. Mm -hmm. And th this is a little bit of a plug for pure research because, mm -hmm. you know, if we hadn't done pre pure research 20 years ago in um, messenger RNA, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have a COVID vaccine. Mm. Um, yep. That is a direct result yep. of our doing that research early on yep. and being prepared to then, to then implement that, okay. um, which is why DOE is funding through the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations uh, 
the early stage investment in this. So I just want everyone to take note that Josh Salislak just linked RNA research to small nuclear reactors. <laughs> <laughs> he said it couldn't be done. Um, Bob, you had a follow-up. I did. I wanted to talk a little bit more about those jobs Please that do. we've been talking about because yeah. I know this is something of interest to a lot of folks here. So my organization, E2, Greg, has been tracking clean energy jobs around the country for more than a decade. And actually just last week we came out with our seventh annual Clean Jobs America report, which tracks clean energy jobs across every sector in every state. What we know is that there are about 3.2 million people that now work in clean energy in America. That grew by Ooh. about 5% last year. Um, you know, uh, uh, renewables, solar and wind, about 500,000, up 6% last year. Mm. Grid and storage, 143,000, mm. up 7%. Clean vehicles, huge uh, growth in clean vehicles, yeah. as we all can expect, uh, that including a lot here in the Midwest. Clean vehicle growth up 26% yeah. last year alone. Yeah. Energy efficiency, the biggest part of clean energy uh, more than 2.2 million people work in energy efficiency right now, uh, up to three, three and a half percent, I think. But important to note, uh, Greg, about 10 percent of clean energy workers in America are veterans. That's a bigger percentage than a lot of other sectors, most sectors mm -hmm. of our economy. Mm -hmm. And why is that? First of all, uh, you can ask uh, folks like Michael Rucker, who's a uh, uh, E2 member in Colorado who owns a wind company and he basically says look I'm gonna hire all the veterans I can because they're not afraid to shimmy up those <laughs> those uh, wind turbines and they're not gonna be afraid yeah. for it. Well the older ones are. That's right yeah. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but it also goes back to that sense of purpose Greg and that sense of mission and that commitment to national security and yeah. to our country. Yeah. We have another great member in Iowa uh, uh, who was in the Navy SEAL for SEAL teams for six years started a company called Ideal Energy. Troy Van Beek, I think he's been here. We've had Troy on a Troy has been here a couple times before. Yep. When you talk to Troy, he says, "Why?" I, I ask him, why did you start this company? He's, he's like, because I, of that sense of mission. I want to continue to give something back yep. to my country. This is it. Yep. We, we have Bowerbird Energy from the East Coast in the house. Uh, a, again, a, a veteran-owned company that uh, uh, has started, I believe, because of that sense of purpose and that dedication to to our country. So uh, the, the opportunities that are going to result from clean energy growth from things like the Inflation Reduction Act, $370 billion pumped into our economy, that's going to create a hell of a lot of jobs. Uh, and those jobs are very befitting, uh, and those investments are very befitting of veterans and veteran-owned companies. Yeah, here, here. Uh, I'm going to go out to the audience for questions as soon as you're ready. So be thinking about your questions and just raise your paw and I'll get a microphone over to you and we'll, we'll, we'll get uh, some input here, give and take. Um, Sarah, let me turn back to you. We have a question? Mr. Patrick Littlefield. <laughs> you got a mic over there somewhere? Well done. Morning, everybody. Um, great panel, thank Good you. Good morning, Patrick. A question for you. Um, we've talked a lot about the US, we've talked a lot about Europe. Um, Recently, the Congo announced their plans to auction off land for oil drilling. C could you just pump it up just a touch? Sure. Thank uh, you. Perfect. Good morning, everybody. We talked a lot about the U.S. We've talked about Europe. Uh, recently, the Congo announced their intention to auction off land in, in, the, in the Congolese forest for oil drilling. Um, and uh, so the question raises, obviously, that has a lot of impact on climate. Th those fo uh, forests are important kind of consumers of carbon. How should we be thinking about climate in terms of the, the global issues? And anybody, you know, our own house may be in good order, but if, if the neighborhood around us is burning down, we are going to be there for long. And I, where that takes me is to diplomacy in the State Department. So from a global perspective, how should we be thinking about those questions in terms yeah. of <coughs> climate, security, and resilience? Kind of following suit with the Amazon, yeah. Um, anyone want to take that on? I mean, from a pure science Please. perspective, I can help, maybe. Yeah, sure. Um, but, but just simply stopping deforestation is gigatons of carbon saved. Mm -hmm. And so for people to forget that would be a tragedy. Yeah. Um, and, and assigning monetary impacts of that, I think people like yourself yeah. and others could, could help to bring to light. It's not just 
tree huggers. It's it's the actual face. Well, and could I just follow up, and then I'll turn to you, Josh. It, but it's also the kind of trees, right? And the whole uh, the whole idea of old growth forests yeah. versus new saplings right. that we're planting as yeah. part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Right. It's not the same no. in terms of the carbon sap. Right. right. A loblolly pine that big is not the same as an old no. growth forest, let yeah. alone the below ground carbon that you'll lose in all the roots and the roots and the soils when it's taken down. Right. So let's talk about the economics for a second. Um, we did a study, uh, I think we released it a couple of months ago um, uh, at Davos in Switzerland. And the, the interesting thing is we looked at what happens economically from a global perspective um, if we do something about climate change over the next 50 years. Um, if we can keep the um, global warming to around 1.5 C. Um, and what happens if we don't? So. Mm -hmm. We ran the economic model in five different sectors around the, uh, uh, around the world. We put the whole thing into a global model. Uh, bottom line, in, at 2070, in, in about 50 years, if we do nothing, the entire global economy loses $178 trillion in value, okay, in, in GDP. That's real GDP. money. That's real money, okay? There's a whole lot of people's lives that go with that. This is not just money, that's, that's people's lives, okay? Yeah. But if we do something, so is climate change inevitable? Is it too expensive? We can't afford to do it anyway? Well, it turns out no. Um, if we actually make these investments, mm -hmm. if we do this work, if we create these jobs, mm -hmm. we grow the economy by a net $44 trillion globally. Wow. Wow. Okay, so real money to be made, yeah. even more to be lost. Now, that's just climate change. We're also looking at, um, and we're starting to do some work around what the value of nature is, right? What is biodiversity worth? And there's a task force um, hmm. similar to the task force on climate-related financial disclosures on nature-related financial disclosures. Mm -hmm. And we are starting, companies are starting to look at what is the value of biodiversity and how important is it to their business? Not just to the world, but mm. to your business. Bottom these are line. not, yeah, these are not just environmental issues. No. These are jobs and economic issues. You know, we're not going to kill the planet from the planet's perspective. We're going to kill our ability to live on the planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And that's the thing we have to be thinking about. Yeah. But we can change this. And we can do it by making these investments, creating these jobs, and getting great people to take and do these jobs. So it's a great answer. What Patrick talked about was the Congo. And he talked about a country that may not be thinking necessarily long-term 2070. They're thinking, hey, you US, you had your yeah. time in the sunshine. Yeah. We want ours. This is near term. This, this is a huge issue, and this is why we are investing in um, in Africa, in Asia, um, in climate technology and clean energy. And we have to do it because those countries' economies require energy. Mm. And if they only have the natural resources if they have, if they just can sell what they have, mm. um, they are going to do that because they, they have to. And we have to help them do, do this a better way. Yeah. Greg, what I, what I would yeah, add Bob, is, is that we can't do anything about the Congo or any other place on the planet here in America if we don't lead and if people yeah. don't take us at our word. Yeah. Uh, in 2015, we crafted the Paris Agreement that brought the world together. Since then, according to a study from Yale and Columbia recently, the United States' leadership on climate metrics, climate-related issues, has gone from about 15 to 101 mm. uh, globally. That's not so good. That's not a lot good. of people are going to uh, yeah. listen to your desires if you're at that level. Yeah. Good news is with the uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, we just sent a signal, a signal to the markets that we're in the business of clean energy in this country mm. again, uh, and a signal internationally that the United States is ready to lead again. Mm -hmm. We've got to get the House to pass it this week, mm -hmm. uh, but we're on the right direction. On the right track. Greg, if I could, I could just yeah, add to please, that. Robert. Uh, diplomacy, as you said, is so important in this. Uh, continuous and robust engagement is such a powerful tool. Um, because as been said, you know, we can't just tell these countries 
you have to, you have to change because the climate demands it. They have to be part of the solution. They can't <coughs> just be spectators. And the way we do that is by getting them in the room, getting them in the dialogue. Every country on this planet has an opportunity to contribute to the solution, not just by maintaining their forests, that's certainly part of it, but proactively by being part of this technology revolution, by being part of the job growth that comes with this $44 trillion. Mm -hmm. And getting them in the room, in the conversation, is how they learn uh, where those opportunities are, where those projects are, and, and how we can kind of bring them into the tent, so to speak. So speaking of that kind of awareness and education, the Secretary of State has a clean ener energy core. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Secretary of Energy has a clean energy core. Oh, it was yeah. a Dutch state. Yeah. Secretary Secretary of we, we have okay. a Department of Energy, clean energy core. Okay. Uh, it, it's primarily domestically focused, um, but this is a, a direct result of the BUILD Act, uh, and okay. it'll, it'll continue to benefit um, from the Inflation Reduction Act. But uh, we are creating thousands of jobs in the United States in the federal government. Uh, and this is, you know, the, the private sector is a, is a great place for veterans. There's tons of opportunities. But I think for some of us, uh, staying in government has been a really natural fit. Um, so we're, we're hiring scientists. We're hiring engineers and all the things that you think of at the Department of Energy. Um, but we're, we're also hiring people like me, social scientists, um, that, that, that don't know uh, the intricacies of biochemistry. Um, but you know, we need HR people, we need <laughs> admin people, we need project managers, people that know how to organize and supervise a project. Um, so there are tons and tons of opportunities uh, for, for veterans to kind of come and, and stay within the government family and really contribute to the solution. Yeah, and get points for being a veteran. A point, you get, you get all sorts of points direct to retirement. All sorts of points. <laughs> Um, hey Zara, let me let me turn it back to you with regard to uh, carbon capture, capture, and specifically converting carbon emissions. What what Lance Attack does? What does the Inflation Reduction Act mean to you from that perspective? So, so I think part of what it's doing is allowing for that diversity of options, right? It's not one option for biofuel now. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of options for a lot of sustainable fuel, and so it's giving a lot of companies options. And it's giving bigger companies options to work with smaller companies to, to bring those options to fruition for, for them as well. So it's, it's, it's really making incentives available to a wider range of, of industry people, but it's also linking, right? We will be, the second hydrogen is there, we're there. We, we, will, we happily utilize hydrogen because we, we, our organism converts hydrogen and CO2 to ethanol. Simple as that. And so as soon as hydrogen infrastructure is in place, we will be the first to accept those streams and make something with it. Hmm. And so I think it's really excited, exciting for a lot of ways, the sustainable aviation fuel incentives and a lot of the carbon utilization. I would challenge carbon transformation is what we do. It, we take carbon that's CO2 and we turn it into products. Um, I think CO2 shouldn't be thought of as waste. I would argue that it's, it's a domestic feedstock that we can now make valuable products from. Um, and so this, this, this act is, is really enabling all these options to come to fruition and not just based on faith, based on incentives, which hits the bottom line, which actually moves things. Because it, it might be the right thing to do, but if yeah. it's not gonna make you money, are you gonna do it? So it's bringing that forward. It's and we do have people that are not scientists that work here. Everyone's picking on me. Hey, we hey, have all the other no jobs too. We, we all aspire to be here. Uh, uh, Josh, I'm turning over to you a second. I, I just want to follow up with it. For those of you who were in the room last night for Farm Free and Die, you know, we heard something very similar from the farmers yeah. turning carbon into a cash crop. That's right. Right? But, but it's got to be regulated. It's got to be monetized. It's got to be predictable. It's got to be all those things that you know market factors will make it, yep. and it's currently not. And that's where government policy comes in. So yep. I, I was just going to say, you know, the um, soils management is another amazing opportunity for us. So soils management. Soils. So soils management. so looking at our agriculture. I mean, we're you know we we have a huge <coughs> agriculture industry, right? Um, and we can use that in a very positive way, not just for food security, but also to look at emission reduction and carbon storage. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, all of these things, using science, mm -hmm. um, 
it's not just, we, I think in the past we, you know, we were consumptive in a way um, that was wasteful. Mm. We didn't really think about it because we didn't have to. Mm -hmm. um, I remember reading uh, uh, the Lewis and Clark book, um, mm -hmm. uh, Undaunted Journey, uh, uh, yeah, Courage, thank you. Um, and you know, it, for those of you who read it, you know they're they're out in the West and they they shoot a buffalo and eat its liver and then they leave the rest of the buffalo. Right. Um, yeah. And I thought, how wasteful, right? Because, right. but there are all these buffalo and right. this is the part we wanted. And they'll keep coming. Yeah. And they're yeah. you know as far as you can see, right? Right. Well, we have to start thinking about how we use the whole buffalo. Um, Great metaphor. And we can do that, and the stuff that Zara's doing. Yeah. Um, some of this kind of really yeah. creative uh, agriculture work, these are all things that we're great at innovation in this country. Yeah. We are really amazing at innovation in yeah. this country. Yeah. And we are going to solve the climate crisis through dedication and innovation. If we're incentivized to do it. Well, we have to. We actually don't have a choice. It's existential. Right? Yeah. 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 So, um, any other questions out there before I turn to another one? Yes, sir. Why don't you go to the mic right there? Perfect. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Oh, hey, thanks, <laughs> thanks for uh, speaking. I, I just wanted to. Could you introduce yourself? Oh, yeah. I'm, uh, my name is Zenon Arendovich, uh, just a former uh, Navy nuke. Uh, now I'm looking for a job. Anyone hiring? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the uh, hands go up in the room. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Yeah. No, I was uh, I, I was really interesting on what what Josh had to said. How it's kind of like this important issue and kind of some of the issues that I was noticing. I'm a big proponent of solar, like solar. Uh, one of the things I I remember reading is that we don't have really a uh, a disposal or recycling method, or and that's not necessarily included in the cost. Uh, does anyone have any any thoughts or input? In, into that and how that's going to kind of shape. I kind of wanted to ask Raj uh, the, the, about it because he was describing yeah. like, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna do all of these things, but like yeah. what happens once they reach end of life? You know, yeah. like with Dominion Energy and, and the offshore wind farms, like, like those have a limited lifespan before they have to replace the, uh, the propellers. Turbine? Uh, Turbines, blades. sorry. <laughs> blades. Blades. Thank blades. you. Is Thank blade, you. Blade the right word? Blades. What's that? Blades. 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 Wow. Yeah. The turbine blades, yeah. Cool. And so that is actually part of our total cost estimate that we've had to develop. And so Siemens Gamesa is the uh, manufacturer, and they probably about now. I don't know, four or five months ago, made a very significant in, uh, announcement about investment that they're going to do in the Hampton Roads, Virginia area. Hmm. They're going to build a blade, the first blade manufacturer facility in the United States. That's great. Um, nice. Europe, you know, certainly has tremendous offshore wind capability right now. It's, they've been doing it for years, and that's where this technology typically resides. Um, but as there have been just two new uh, offshore leases in the North Carolina uh, area in the last two to three months, and then the one that we're developing, and then also up in the Northeast, this is a market not just for uh, climate security, but for economic growth and security. Um, <coughs> we know that this is gonna stimulate jobs, stimulate uh, the economic development in the um, mid-Atlantic region. And so, um, you know, how will we produce, install, maintenance, and then uh, recover mm. the blades? It's a full life cycle, right? Mm. And then all of the additional um, jobs and um, support that goes into that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, that is something that Dominion is is very excited about because we know that this is not just a um, you know bid to improve how we provide uh, clean re renewable energy to our customers, but it's also um, a way that we can um, put jobs into the communities in which we serve. Yeah, here, here. 
It's, it's a great question. Great question. Uh, and, and fortunately, w companies like Dominion and others are thinking about this. Uh, and the good news is we have the time to think about it, whereas we're still trying to figure out what to do with waste from other energy sources like nuclear, like uh, oil and gas and other industries that uh, we also need to address, Yeah, which is probably more expensive. Yeah, yeah. But DOE is investing in this, and that's part of that, that advanced research, okay. is to figure out how to make the panels right. um, recyclable. You know, recyclable or reusable or pull things out of them, or maybe replace the panel with a better technology that's much more efficient. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks Thank guys. you. Thank you. Any other questions? Drew, let me, uh, let me follow up with you and ask you how the rush invasion of Ukraine has affected Dominion Energy, right? In other words, what we've seen front and center is that it's a global energy market. What happens in Ukraine, the Black Sea, affects us, affects their world countries. How is it affecting Dominion Energy, and what are you guys doing about it? Well, I think that what we've seen is the you know increase in uh, price of natural gas has certainly mm -hmm. been a factor in how we uh, control affordability for our customers. Mm -hmm. um, but energy independence, uh, as has been spoken, um, is not just uh, good for the economy, but it is vital for national security. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I think from Dominion's perspective, we see the ability to you know, provide, obviously, a significant resource to customers, but we also see a way to serve the, uh, the communities that we live in mm -hmm. and also stimulate um, and provide more security uh, for our nation. And so those are you know, kind of small, medium, and large responsibilities as a, uh, as a company. And we take that enormously seriously. I mean, it is a very important uh, way that we see uh, our role, not just uh, as a, uh, a provider of um, energy and, and electricity. And there it is, energy security, national security, and climate security all wrapped up in one closing statement. Well done. Okay, hey, please uh, help me in thanking a terrific panel for our global energy and climate security. Thank you all. Thank you.